It's an honor for me to be here. I'm very, really excited, really nervous. This is my alma mater. I graduated from USC in 91, so it's really special for me to be here to talk about my two passions, Armenia and wine. Um, I, as many of us, have reinvented myself again about a year ago after having worked in the wine sector, wine industry in Spain for about a decade, had the opportunity to move to Armenia to represent Armenia Wine Company. It's one of the trailblazers in this new era, this new renaissance of Armenian winemaking. So this is my second vintage in Armenia Wine Company and in Armenia. And, um, there's so many stories to be told. I know I have 10 minutes. I'll try to fit into the time. You'll be seeing some images behind me. And um, this is a very important development for Armenia. And I hear, let's try to understand why and why it's important for Armenia. Mm -hmm. I'll try to give you a bit of a background. So let's start from the Bible. Um, Noah, Noah's Ark landed in Mount Ararat. And he planted the first vineyards made wine, got drunk, fell asleep, naked. <laughs> so some things never change. Millennia later, science, geneticists, archaeologists, um, historians are proving today that Armenia or the Armenian highlands were the, um, the origin of wine domestication and winemaking. Um, there are lots of interesting um, archaeological findings. I don't know if any of you have been to Armenia lately, but um, I recommend you go visit these findings. One of them is Areni Cave 1, which is in an area in Bayotzor. These are highlands of Armenia. It's Areni. Areni is also a grape varietal. And now I hear some young Armenian girls are being called Areni. I think this is also connected to this revolution of wine. Um, and um, this is the first, I mean, dating back to 6100 BC, this is the first full cycle winery um, in the world, which I think is such an exciting finding. I mean, this is also the same place they found the first shoe. I know you might have seen the oldest shoe in the world. So we had really cool predecessors, you know, they knew <laughs> what was important. Good wine and good uh, shoes. Um, what you're seeing now, these are the archaeological findings in Teishe Bani. It's Karmir Blue, where about 450 or about 500 uh, clay amphora have been found, also proving that wine, this is 7,000 before Christ, 7, 7th century before Christ. So, I mean, this is a heritage we have had. Um, our predecessors were winemakers. Um, as um, the um, panelist before me was speaking about the Greek philosophers talking about Armenian history and talking about Armenian trade, uh, Armenia was known as the land of vineyards. Armenian traders were trading down the Tigris River to the Assyrians. They would sell our wine. We're well known for our wine. We're fast forwarding to the, the USSR because we cannot go through all the millennia. And this is also another chapter in our history which is actually quite... Um, um, it, it was a great change for Armenia in many ways, you know, and winemaking also was greatly affected. First of all, because all the wineries were made public in 1920s under Ararat Trust, and also there was a decree by Stalin who decided that Armenia is going to be making brandy, while Georgia should concentrate on his native Georgia was to make wine. So Armenia viticulture was directed into um, brandy making. We became very good at it. We were producing, I think, I don't know, the numbers changed 25-30% of all of brandy or so-called cognac for the Soviet Union. But what happened with the grapes for um, wine, I mean most of the red grape varietals were uprooted because for brandy you need a particular grape. It's white grape and it was, the accent was on volume, not quality. Another blow was dealt um, by Gorbachev in 1985 when he decided to fight alcoholism by uprooting, giving another decree to uproot the vines in Armenia as well. By the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the industry was gone. There was, you know, great vineyards abandoned, no wine really being made, proper wine. So about 10 years ago, we're seeing this amazing boom in, um, in winemaking and viticulture, 
And one of the trailblazers of this movement is the company I represent, Armenia Wine Company, which was one of the first to believe that if we're making such fantastic brandy, why can't we also make you know, wines of great quality and compete in international markets? Um, the first vineyards were planted in, about two, in, not a, in 2006. In 2008, we found that the winery was found. It's a family business. Uh, Varkes Vartanian is the founder, a young businessman who was in Italy visiting partners for his travertine business, was entertained in his beautiful villa, said, what is this? Where am I? And they said, well, this is a winery. And he said, why don't we have something like this at home? So this was a dream, of course. And if anybody's involved in the wine sector, this is not a quick, rich scheme. Um, wine making is a very long process. In Europe, it's the fifth, sixth generation that may see the fruits of the predecessors. So 10 years in winemaking is nothing. The best equipment from all over the world has been brought to Armenia, which is a feat in itself. Um, when I saw the winery for the first time, I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, I have seen, I've worked in the business for 10 years. I've worked for the, one of the most, well, the fourth largest wine producer in Europe. And I've seen wine technology. This was the Rolls Royce of production. I'm like, oh my God, this is here. So it was really an honor to join the professionals at Armenia Wine to get the wines out. Um, God, there's so much to say. The wines are special. It's our history. You know, there's so many stories to be told, besides, besides that the cradle of winemaking, the indigenous grape varietals that are se centuries old, um, the amazing terroir. We are a volcanic country. This makes the wine, and it's a high altitude country, so, I mean, the lowest grapes are growing, or vine vineyards are about 800 meters above sea level. This is really a unique feat. I mean, there are very few places in the world who, that have this terroir. So all of these factors um, and coupled with our Armenian ingenuity, hard work, creativity, globality, I think the projects should be really, really, um, I mean, it's a great opportunity for Armenia to get out there and to export. Um, uh, it's quite amazing also because of these new players in the market, the quality of wines in general has gone up. So there's about 35 wineries making wine in Armenia. And most amazing fact, I mean, five of them are within one year. You have five new wineries per year. There's this ent enthusiasm for wine in Yerevan. I don't know if you visited lately, but there's wine streets, wine bars, wine festivals. Um, we, there'll be Areni Wine Festival next week. There's the Yerevan Wine Days. The organizers were surprised because they thought maybe a few hundred people will show up. I mean, it was packed. The Yerevan um, on Sadian Street, it was a party, you know, just people pouring wine, drinking. You'll see some footage later on. So, I mean, this coupling of the heritage of our ancient history, although it had gone into hibernation through this period of the Soviet uh, Republic, we're coupling the knowledge, using the knowledge of our ancestors and the indigenous uh, varietals, and yet using also the modern technologies to make better wines, make clean wines, make wines that appeal to the international consumer. Um, there's so many ways to innovate, but great, no matter what is technology, the wine is made in a vineyard. This is our biggest challenge, because um, years of um, collective farming has killed the love of the land or working. It's the most, I think, noble work, is work being a farmer. And we've lost this a little bit. And agriculture at the moment, I mean, farming uh, of grapes right now in Armenia is the most developed part of farming in Armenia, or the f uh, most developed sector of farming in Armenia, agricultural. So this is also very important. We have to keep planting vineyards because we have about, they say, about 17,000 hectares, which is nothing if you think of Spain that has one million hectares. Of course, we will never be competing in volume with any um, old world or new world um, wine producers. But we have our place in the market. We have a really amazing product. We have to find our niche. And it's quality, it's our history, it's the stories we have to tell. And I think it's really incredible to tell somebody, listen, this is the same wine you're drinking that 7,000 years ago people drank. I mean, there are these, I think, you know, there's, there's no, I mean, the, the most antique um, varietals are growing in Armenia. So we have to maintain them, and we have to make the wines that are not only quirky or really high-end, that only very few can afford, but to be able to show the world that this is a really interesting offer. 
you're seeing some images from the last harvest. This is Kangun. Actually, this is also an innovation. Kangun is one grape that is prevalent in Armenia. It's a white grape varietal that has been, it's a, it's a technical grape. It has been created for brandy production. Armenia Wine was the first company that decided to, uh, they said, let's try it for wine. I mean, for, for not for brandy, because um, we have to work, we have, we're learning, we're learning what can we do with these varietals. We have specialists from um, France, from Germany, from Italy, and also other wineries as well um, that are getting to know the Armenian varietals. And we're making fantastic white wines from a grape that originally was for brandy only. Um, these are the images from Armavir. This is, these are our own vineyards. It's about 800 to 1,000 meters above sea level. And um, I don't know what else can I tell you. <laughs> I think that's it about. So, I mean, um, coming back, what is, do Armenian wines have a chance in the world? Yes, absolutely. 10 years is nothing in winemaking. What has been done in 10 years, it's really, it's really incredible. Um, and uh, with all the complications we have logistically, politically, I mean, it's quite expensive. We need some materials that we cannot source in Armenia, so that's being imported. Um, and physical export of um, the, the shipments, it's a quite a complicated scheme if you're not shipping a full container. So these are all challenges, but I think little by little we're getting out there. A small example, um, quite recently we won a tender for the fin Finland monopoly. It's the state that um, has the rights for import of all alcohol in Finland. A small trial order, well actually it's not a trial, it's a tender we won, it's for a long-term collaboration, but the, the order itself is small. They've been trying for five months to get the order out. There was no logistical partner who could deliver a few pallets to Finland. They're air lifting it out. It left Friday. So these are some challenges we have to work through, but I mean, hopefully the few pallets will become a container, then we can uh, uh, do the freight more easily. And we also count on the support of all the Armenians out there. When you are in a restaurant, ask for Armenian wines. You know, give it a try. Don't have a, an idea of how good can they be. You'll be surprised. There's some amazing potential. There's some fantastic wineries from boutique, little family wineries to a, a company like Armenia Wine with five million bottles capacity. So, um, and you have, we all have to be messengers. This is good for Armenia, this is good for our farming, it's good for our economy. There's so many reasons. And uh, that's it, thank you for your attention. <laughs>